So the doors are closing, and that means we get to start. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris Priestley. Some of you may know me as Evil Chris. I'm the part of the community team at BioWare. Thank you all for hosting uh, PAX Australia. A big thank you to Penny Arcade for finally giving an excuse for us to come down and talk with you, our Australian fans. Uh, big thanks to our enforcers. Uh, they're always awesome. They're a huge part of PAX. Respect your enforcers while you're visiting. They're so cool for us. But thank you all for coming out, for lining up. Uh, it blows our minds when, you know, we're, we're like, oh, we better go start heading towards the theater. Oh my God, look at this line. Uh, thank you all so much for waiting for us. Uh, we're really flattered for your attention. It's great that you're here with us today. Uh, I'm gonna turn the panel over to the people that are with us. Most of what we're gonna be doing here today is a Q&A. We want to talk with you, answer your questions. We don't get down to Australia as much as we'd like to, so we want to give you as much chance to ask questions as possible. But uh, just before I turn it over, one thing I'd really like for everybody to do, uh, I'm going to just bring up Vine here on my phone. Uh, if everybody here would uh, give me a, I'll count to three, and we'll uh, do a little wave back for the folks at Bioware, because they're going to be floored that there's this many people here in Australia that wanted to come out and see us. <laughs> So on the count of three, just give me a wave and say, uh, hello from Australia, Bioware. One, two, three. Hello from Australia, Bioware. That's awesome, thank you. And that's enough out of me for right now. I'm gonna turn it over to the people that are here on the panel with. Uh, panelist number one, sign in, please. Hi, can everybody? Everybody hear me? Yes. Hooray. <laughs> uh, I'm Patrick Weeks. Uh, I'm a writer at BioWare. I spent most of my time on the Mass Effect trilogy. If you, if you, <laughs> so if you, if you ever rode in an elevator and heard awkward elevator conversations, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, on Mass 2, they let me, they let me do a few plots and I, uh, I got to help out with making people cry about Geth and Quarians in Mass Effect 3. Um, since then, I've moved on to the Dragon Age team, and I'm really, really jazzed yeah. to be working on Inquisition. I believe I'm done. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Weeks. Yes, I'm married to him, and I also work at BioWare. I'm the lead editor for our Edmonton and Montreal studios. I've worked on... Um, Dragon oh, Age what? Origins, I know, I'm, I'm getting old. I've been there a while. Dragon Age Origins, Mass Effect 2, Dragon Age 2, Mass Effect 3, and now I'm also working on Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, and Sonic. And Sonic, I was also on Sonic. I always forget about that, but yeah. Um, it's a little game. Uh, so yeah, our editing team pretty much fixes what the writing team does. Um, <laughs> That's not in, well. It's it's a little bit true, but um, true so we have we have ish. We there are teams of between five and eight writers on each of our major projects, and so uh, we try to ensure consistency among the voices. You know, when you've got five different people writing Commander Shepard, our goal is to not have it sound like five different people are writing Commander Shepard. So we um, watch out for tone things and, and some spelling things and IP things. Um, I also am the liaison between the writing team and our. VO department, so when we're working with the actors, explaining all the really weird stuff we make up, how do you pronounce R. Yakshi, and things like that. Um, I, I, I help record pronunciation guides and have occasionally stomped back into the writing room saying, no, humans can't say this, you have to change this name, that's not okay. Um, and then we work with all the, the non-VO text, all the weapons descriptions and, and Codex entries and all the other words. That and even non-game stuff, because uh, oh, yeah, when we write stuff, things yeah. like Bioware blogs and that yep. sort of thing. Uh, just about things that go on around the office, or you know, the recently the 10th anniversary of Knights of the Old Republic, that sort of thing. We, we pass them on to the editing team to make sure that we're using our words good. We try to help the words be more better. Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, thank you all so much for being here. We are a tiny Sick. part of a really big team, exactly. and thank you for waving to everybody He's because enjoying. it's really an honor to get to represent all the people that we work with, and really an honor to I'm come so talk with you. So thank you so much. Service you provide. So. <laughs> 
So, hi guys, my name is Cameron Lee. Uh, I'm a producer uh, at Bioware, so uh, at the moment, very much focused on Dragon Age Inquisition. And as you can tell from my accent, I am Australian, so I'm actually, I'm originally from Melbourne. Uh, I haven't been at Bioware as long as these guys. Um, it's, I think it's about a year today, so it's great to come down here, um, get a free holiday, meet my friends, <laughs> meet my family, you know what I mean? So, every year, this is the plan, you know? Um, but you know, for my job as a producer, it's really to represent you guys and, and understand what you guys want and, and how we, as a team, can create something that you guys absolutely love. So that's, that's pretty much what I do, which is awesome. It's funny, to to you guys and get to you know, hear what you, work, what you want. Uh, and then someone will translate it to, to you guys, you know, and hopefully it gets done. So. So I think what we'll do, uh, I've got a little something to show you guys and uh, take you guys through a bit of uh, Dragon Age Inquisition stuff. There's not a lot we can really talk about, um, but I can show you a few things uh, today. I'm going to start off with... Mr. Sherlock, if a hired me from my manager, said it wouldn't be a problem if I took his father's um, place tonight because... The E3 trailer that he did for Dragon Age Inquisition. So hopefully some of you guys have seen it, if you haven't then... I was discussing an artificial sweetener with a suspect earlier on. Yeah, looks and feels... I've seen more of this war than you can imagine. None shall be untouched by the fires above. That took us uh, probably about 30 people for case, around it got me five or about six some weeks unusual to sort of crunch and get that thing done. Um, it was a lot of fun to do it, and uh, I was lucky enough to go down to E3 uh, with Aaron, our GM, to be in the audience when this thing was shown for the first time. It was absolutely insane. It was a massive auditorium full site. of people. It, it was new. Uh, and you know, been weathered by the elements, yes. First, I so thought humbling and, and, and you can be so proud of the like beach. out there but that people are going to really get behind. They haven't done that at Far Rockaway in over a year. So, how does sand make it? Toss in. For people who aren't aware, that's that's all in engine. Yes. Sand. So that's that's not that's not that's not a pre-rendered third party. That's yes. So that's really Varric's chest hair. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, when we did this, we also released this image here, um, you know, Dragon Age Inquisition. And uh, oh, I'm going to panel, blah, blah, blah. You've already introduced ourselves, whatever. Uh. <laughs> we don't matter. So I'm going to go back to this image here, right? Because I've had a lot of people uh, ask me questions about this on Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. They go, Cam, is that the player character? What's the deal with the rings? You know, what's the helmet? Whatever. Is it a quest giver? Um, but really, it's, it's none of those things. It's, it's actually a, a representation of, of a concept and a, a principle that we try and take towards Dragon Age uh, Inquisition, which is this is your game, right? This is an invitation for you to pick up the helmet and for you to join us in the game that we're making for you guys, right? So it's your world, it's your story, it's your characters, you know, it's your decisions. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do with Dragon Age Inquisition. So I just wanted to, to highlight that because not many people uh, understand it, you know, and that's really from our perspective what we're trying to do. So, what can we talk about? 
So the PR people um, back home, uh, they did send me a, a joke version of this, you know, after they'd taken edits out of it. And it was basically this slide, and I'd hit another button, and it'd be like, nothing. <laughs> but it, it's not quite that bad. Um, so I can talk a little bit about, about the E3 trailer and why we included the shots that we did in that. Um, and then we can get into a, li a little bit of Q&A after that. So, Epic World, World and Chaos, absolutely, right? So we heard you guys after DA2. Um, we wanted to go back to a much bigger, broader, epic kind of a story, something like Origins, um, where you, know, you need a massive world to, to show this story. Uh, and in this particular iteration uh, of the Dragon Age uh, franchise, the world is absolute in chaos, right? Um, and really, what says chaos more than this humongous dragon with a huge rift in the sky and demons pouring out, right? So this is you know, part of the reason why we included these sorts of shot in, shots in the trailer. Um, it really is a big story. Uh, it's very epic. There's big bad guys, um, big dragons. Um, and you know, nations are war, right? So you know, we included this shot because it's about humans fighting humans and the chaos that goes with that and, and the backdrop of you know, all that the writers create. So uh, we included that. So decisions that matter, yes, of course, absolutely. Um, Again, you know, we heard you. Um, and this shot here, we wanted to include this scene because this is a scene in the game which is a direct consequence of a decision that you may or may not make through the game, right? This is a, a village which has been absolutely destroyed. Everyone's dead because you did or didn't do a, a certain thing, right? And this is one example of many, many things uh, that's gonna be in, in, in the game. Um, it's very important to us that you feel like the decisions and the actions that you take have real consequence um, and impact the world in a, a really meaningful way. Returning characters, Cassandra. Yes, absolutely, she will be there. Um, we can't say whether they're going to be followers, whether they're going to be main characters or anything like that. <laughs> OK, someone's happy. Um, Varric, of course, because we needed the chest hair, right? And Morrigan. We knew everyone wanted Morrigan. So David Gator, I think, writes Morrigan, right? Yeah. So he'll be very happy that everyone loves Morrigan. Uh, we all love her. We wanted to bring her back. Um, and thank we've got a chance to, to do so. So yay for me. And that's who I romance, so rock on. <laughs> uh, you lead the Inquisition uh, in, in Dragon Age Inquisition. So there is a, a, an organization which you take part on and you, you form and you, uh, you get to lead throughout the course of the game. Um, and I, I can't go too much into it, but I can say it's definitely not part of the Chantry. Uh, there was some concern on the forums, which we do read a lot of, um, that you would have to be some sort of like a religious sort of organization. No, it's not, not the case. Um, the Inquisition, going back to the premise of how we're making the, the game, this is your game, right? So it's your Inquisition. So it gets to be whatever you want it to be. And of course, you know, here's a, a shot from the trailer, you know, of someone, of the Inquisition sort of been uh, you know, making some decisions and, and plotting, et cetera. And I will point out, and this thing snuck in, right? We, we didn't <laughs> actually know until quite late. But if you notice on the, the left-hand side, there's this kind of book with a guy in a vest, right? And it looks kind of creepy, and it's because it is. Right? <laughs> and I don't, know, I don't know a lot about it, but I think Patrick and Karen would know more about this. <clears throat> So the, the book in question might possibly be uh, a book alluded to in Dragon Age 2, um, the work of one Varric Tethris, um, Hard in Hightown, <laughs> which... And yes, it is what you think it's about with that title. And if it's visible in this trailer, then canonically, Cassandra is a fan. <laughs> Which makes, gives the interrogation frame story from DA to an entirely different context. <laughs> Got a bit of a misery thing. I yeah. So this thing snuck through and, and wicked. OK, I love that kind of stuff. Writers <laughs> love when this happens. Yes. <laughs> so combat. We know everyone wants to know about combat. Um, what, what I can say is that um, we know that there is a large group of people that loved the tactical, thoughtful, slower combat from Dragon Age Origins. Um, we know there is a number of people that liked Dragon Age 2's combat for its fluidity. Uh, maybe not its respawning waves of enemies, but there was something to be said for, for that type of combat as well. Um, so it is our job to satisfy both crowds and to, to create something which 
um, merges the, the best of the two uh, into an experience which everyone can enjoy uh, without diluting uh, the parts that make it great. So that's all I can really say, but there are definitely going to be new creatures. So again, going back to E3 trailer, we included this guy who's really scary looking. Um, so here's a new demon that's going to be uh, in the game. And this guy who's <laughs> big, um, <laughs> he's actually really deceptively big. Um, he's got this, you can't see it here, but he's got this big kind of like club on his, on his other hand. He like slams it down and like stuff shatters everywhere. So it's pretty cool. Um, I think you'll see a lot of him. He's a lot of fun to, to fight. Uh, this guy, the nightmare, is, sorry for the pun, but he's an absolute nightmare to fight. <laughs> like, he, he sort of, he sinks into the ground, he comes up behind you and he does some stuff and he shoots this black stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, so gross. you get a couple of those and it's, it's kind of chaotic. So it's very cool. Okay, exploration. Um, Bioware has been known for exploration in the past and we really want to come back to that in a big way with this game. So there's lots of exploration, there's lots of different areas. Um, and you can sort of explore and find things. It might be small dungeons, it might be big dungeons, it might be, I don't know, some piece of lore sitting around that you just happen to find, you know, but anything that's kind of uh, interesting and exciting which you guys can sink your teeth into. And um, for that purpose, you know, here's a, a picture of a, one of those areas that you're gonna get to explore. And this is a deceptively normal looking place. It's actually a normal place where really weird things go on. Uh, you can't tell from this, this shot, but um, it, I think it'll be a lot of fun when we get through it. We've been working on this, this area quite a lot uh, over the last six months. Diverse environments. So, yes, absolutely. I'm Not sure the same cave again oh, and again. This is a different I game. wasn't going to say it, but okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so, I'm sure you guys have seen this concept art uh, in the past. It's been floated around on the net, etc. So. Absolutely, we're going to have diverse environments. Uh, so these kind of like overgrown sort of areas, you know, with big sort of trees. We've got uh, snow-capped mountains, big castles, things like that. Uh, plains that kind of remind me of Edmonton, but without the big rocks. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we've got all of that stuff um, and many more. Uh, it's it's quite exciting to see the breadth of the world that we get to explore. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to to getting the game out there and um, and showing you guys, you know, what the team's been been able to create. So, do you want more? Do I say any more? Okay. So, we really didn't want to come down here and fly the 19 hours of flying and, for me, nine hours of stopovers um, and not show you guys anything. Um, you, we can't do what we do without you guys supporting us. So, thank you, right? Um, and to say thank you, I went around to the team before I left and I said, can I, can I have some concept art or, or something you know, to take down to the guys in Australia? They gave me a couple of pieces. No one's seen this stuff before, so you guys are the first that, that get to see this. Um, but again, it speaks to the, the diverse environments that we have. So we have this sort of an environment, which is it's kind of like uh, desert and um, sort of oases, and there's sort of water and hidden kind of locations, which is pretty cool. So we're working on this. This is in the game at the moment. It's pretty badass, actually. Um, swamps and like hidden ruins and, and just really interesting places to, to, to explore and to find. Um, we're going to have all these things in there. So again, you know, we've got swamps, plains, mountains, um, what else? Deserts. Deserts. Um, snow. And snow. Ton heaps. So it, it's going to be really interesting um, and we're really looking forward to, to bringing that out. And then there was, of course, this shot. I'm not exactly sure what this shot says, other than <laughs> canaries maybe related Things to with dragons horns. with horns. Um, but it's a great shot, and um, I think it says a little bit about the game. And that's really all I've got to say. Um, so I think maybe we can get into some questions at this point. Yeah. Um, one other thing. Oh, that sorry. One other thing. Not long to wait. <laughs> yeah. We know you want more, and uh, we, know we, want, we know you want to find out more. Um, it is coming. So be a little bit patient and, uh, and you'll find out all you want to know. Stay tuned, yes. as they say. And we are going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, one thing I'm going to uh, kind of cut off before it even begins. We have announced that there is another Mass Effect title in the works. Uh, this is being developed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we have announced it's in the works. Uh, it's being developed uh, mostly at our Montreal studio. We have a studio in Montreal, Canada, as well as Edmonton. Uh, some support from the Edmonton team, uh, Casey Hudson, the project director, that sort of thing. It is too early to talk about that at all. 
we can't hint, we can't show concept art, we can't do anything like that. Uh, it's time will come. Those of you that follow, you know, people from that studio on Twitter and so forth know they've recently completed the design bible, so they're getting the work done. Uh, it is in development, but really, you know, if you ask, yeah, well, so what about Mass Effect the next? Uh, we're not going to be able to answer. So uh, we, we are open up to pretty much any question if you want to talk a little bit about Dragon Age, you know, the past, the present, that sort of thing, uh, any past games, what it's like working in, you know, 10 feet of snow with minus 54 degree winters and all that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're open to questions, but uh, yeah, we want to hear from you. So if you have questions, our enforcers have microphones. Hello. Hello. Psych. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Hello. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Okay. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming down here, by the way. Thank you for having uh, us. We don't get this kind of thing very often, so kudos for making the trip. Uh, what I wanted to ask, um, obviously uh, when Dragon Age 3 comes out, Inquisition, that's going to be you know, available on next-gen platforms as well. Um, obviously PC and things like that. Um, for people who have played the earlier Dragon Ages on earlier systems, how are you going to take that into account in terms of transferring data, save files, decisions that have been made? How's that going to work? Like, so, do you know how that's going to work yet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we know. Um, mm -hmm. We're not going to talk about it yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, this, this is why PR it's just said, this say right. nothing. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, we, have a, we know what we want to do. Um, it will absolutely come across. Um, you know, your decisions will, will carry and, and it will matter. Um, but yeah, we, we can't go into details about how it's going to work. Sorry. But we are thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. And the goal is, I think, unless Cameron lunges over and starts choking me as I say <laughs> this, then we can say that uh, the goal is that you can have an equally rich experience uh, no matter which platform you're playing on. Yep, absolutely. Yep. No lunging. I don't start you. Yeah, at the back. We are right. uh, It's a pleasure to have you down here. It's actually good to see an American company come down to Australia and sort of give us the time of day. We very rarely get that. Um, basically, I just wanted to say we've seen the rise and fall of several trilogies this generation. We've seen Mass Effect, we've seen Dragon Age, now we've Dragon Age 3 being announced. Uh, and we've also seen The Witcher as well. Um, basically, I want to say, with those trilogies, mistakes have been made for both companies, and obviously there's been benefits from both companies in their production of those games. Uh, do you feel you've evolved from the mistakes of certain titles in your portfolio? Uh, and do you feel that the sort of the rise of The Witcher, especially Witcher 3, uh, do you feel that Inquisition's going to be able to compete or surpass it in any particular level. <laughs> Not to be offensive, I apologise for that, but after Dragon Age 2, I felt um, very yeah. disappointed, to say the least. Um, so that was a loaded absolutely. question. I apologise. I mean, the, the team is the team's brilliant, um, and we have the time, and we we push the date out by a year um, than original originally planned. Um, so absolutely, you know, it's um, they're different games. Um, Slightly, you know, there's different focuses in different areas. Um, you know, I think the AI will um, be incredible. Um, so I, 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 you know, well, I think compete is the wrong word. Yeah. I, I, yeah. there's, yeah. there's, I think there's a story that people want to tell where the video game companies hate each other and our game is going to crush theirs, mm -hmm. and that's really not true. Like, I. I came to Bioware because I love games, and I hope that uh, the next Witcher game is fantastic, yeah. and I hope that ours is fantastic, and I hope that people buy both and play both. The more people we that are playing really, really good yeah. video yeah, games, yeah. role-playing games, is great for all of us. I mean, every time another great game comes out and raises the bar, that's, that's not threatening. It's only mm. threatening if we don't think we can ever do anything better. Yeah. So we look at something and go, that's a fantastic game. How am I going to incorporate the, that awesome thing and, you know, and do it in a Bioware fashion? So, no, I, I think that you know, our biggest competition, the only thing we absolutely want to crush is what we've done in our past games. Uh, that's, one of, that's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be on the Dragon Age team. It's one of the reasons I was proud to be on the Mass Effect team, that 
every new project, we said, okay, let's let's look at the best things we did on our previous game, and let's see how we how we beat that. Let's see how we make that look antiquated and quaint uh, as we go into our next game. With that being said, do you feel we would just disregard Dragon Age 2 and focus more on the origins in terms no. of gameplay story? No, I think I think both games had great points to them. Uh, both games had things that people wanted improvement on, uh, and both games had areas where I think they excelled. I, I love the combat in DA2. Uh, now, we've heard concerns about level art reuse, um, occasional enemies dropping from the sky, <laughs> but, uh, but personally, I, I, loved, I loved how the combat was faster and more fluid. I loved how uh, it made my character move around the area more effectively, and I wouldn't want to lose that. What I would want to do is make sure that Dragon Age 2 still, uh, Dragon Age 3 allows the more tactical options uh, that Origins had. I've yeah. been with Bioware for over 13 years, and uh, we always try to learn from what we've done before and try to make it better. This doesn't mean that everything we try is going to be a big success. And, but what is important for us, and it's, it's really key for us, we listen to our fans, we take the feedback that we get, and we go, okay, they like this. Oh, good, good. We hope they'd like this. They didn't like that so much. Oh, really? Wow, we were hoping they'd like that more. Okay, we can adapt that. We can make it better the next time. And that's a key thing for Bioware. Sure. Hello. Um, thank you for coming down. Um, thank, thank you, shadowy figure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you're probably not going to be able to answer this, but um, having been keeping up with the novels as well as the games, um, understanding that there'll be a lot of focus on the mage and Templar relationships and the Canari and everything about that, um, do you think we might see a return to a more dark spawn oriented story or like stronger focus on that? I, I just felt, I kind of miss it a little bit, but <laughs> not to say that I don't like the other. Yeah. You need some what, sorry? He Not was hoping for a more dark spawn. Oh, yeah. the, the, story, the story details we, we can't really get into at this point, unfortunately. I feel like PR. I think it's important, though, to... One thing, we, we often get this kind of confusion between Mass Effect and Dragon Age. Mass Effect was a trilogy of title based on Commander Shepard. It was Commander Shepard's adventure in the world of Mass Effect. Dragon Age is a story of the world. Unlike, it's not the story of one person in the world, like with Mass Effect was Commander Shepard and who he or she interacted with. Dragon Age is the story of the world. So in Dragon Age Origins, it was the story of the Warden fighting the Darkspawn. And in Dragon Age 2, it was the story of Hawk. In Dragon Age 3, it's going to be the story of the Inquisition and the choices that you make and all the stuff we can't talk about yet. <laughs> but. You know, there, there will absolutely be some ties to previous games, you know, maybe some of the books, you know, the lore, that sort of thing that you'll recognize if you've played the previous games, but they're not gonna be reliant upon the previous games. It's gonna be, you know, cornerstones that you touch that you're like, okay, I get that because I've played DAO or I've played DA2, I've read one of David's novels, one of Patrick Weeks's upcoming novels, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, but it doesn't directly tie or respond to what is previous. So that's about as obscure and vague as I can yeah. be on that. That's good, I like that. <laughs> Hi, first let's just let me say that I personally fell in love with Varric, which was a big surprise to me, can I say. And I'll be playing Age of War for the next game, just for Varric. Uh, my question is, in Dragon Age 2, you introduced a voice for Hawk. Will our character in Dragon Age 3 have a voice again? I think Mike actually has answered this, so we, yeah, we can actually answer yeah. this one. That, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't see us going back to a silent protagonist. Um, now what oh, I... No, no, you, it's, it, yeah, no, it's, we're really happy with that. What we do want to do is, um, I think, learn from some of the experiences with, DA, uh, with DA2's Hawk. It was the first time trying it. Um, people really liked the responsiveness. Um, some people also ran into situations where they felt they didn't understand that something Hawk was saying was because of something Hawk had said earlier in the conversation, a, a dialogue option that was chosen. So I think we're going to be a little bit more aware of that um, in, in the conversations with uh, where, the, where the player makes a choice. Um, 
and also we heard some some concerns on Mass Effect 3 about the amount of auto dialogue and I it, looking at both of those I think it's something we're going to you know manage carefully we always want it to be tuned to a point where it flows naturally um, but I, I think we will definitely have the auto dialogue. Yeah, and paraphrasing, sorry, and the, the how you paraphrase view. as well uh, yeah. with, with the text is really important. Some people were concerned that, that what they picked from a text, the paraphrase text, you know, didn't necessarily reflect what talk or, or Someone said, could right? write a and doctoral dissertation <laughs> on paraphrase text. Yeah. It sounds like it would be the easiest thing ever, and Karen routinely has to fix all of mine. <laughs> It's like that's a that's a really good line, Patrick, and the paraphrase in no way relates to what you just said. Yeah. Just just quickly on that subject, then, will there be the opportunity to choose a voice? To or what? Will, sorry. Will we have the opportunity to choose from a selection of voices? Um, that we probably yeah. can't yeah, we get can't into answer. at this uh, point. Okay. All right. Well, I certainly hope there will be that opportunity because it did sort of great to sound like a British princess, to be honest, as opposed <laughs> to a hardcore fighting character. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Building on the previous question, uh, would the hero of Inquisition now have a first name? Like, for example, in uh, Mass Effect and in uh, Dragon Age 2, uh, your mom or your paramour will call you by your last name, and that would be kind of weird. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, I. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I won't say anything. <laughs> That's yeah. one of those we can't like, answer was, yet yes. questions. Yes. Yeah. yes. Sorry. There's. Hi. I was wondering in the wake of Kickstarter and the projects particularly done, started by, I believe, Obsidian Entertainment and In Exile with Wasteland 2 and Project Eternity mm -hmm. and um, uh, Torment, Tides of Numenera, what you guys actually thought of crowdfunding, crowdfunded projects rather, and the benefits and risks and as well as that, how you actually feel about these titles that are, in some cases, making a resurgence of almost nearly uh, about 18 years since Wasteland 1 for Wasteland 2. They're awesome. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. It's I great. I'm hanging out for Shadowrun. We I'm also hanging out for Shadowrun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so disappointed I missed that Kickstarter. No, I was just checking in on a couple of things that we've backed on, on Kickstarter. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, it seems like... Um, it, it creates a fascinatingly open level playing field. Anyone that's got an idea, anyone that's got the passion and enthusiasm, um, it, it does take often a great deal of money to get a game out these days. And it's so exciting to, to get to see such a variety of new ideas that wouldn't ever be able to see the light of day without Kickstarter. So I think, I think it's fabulous myself. Yeah, it lets people experiment a little bit as well, which is yeah. great. So, and, and we look at it and we, you, know, you can learn from it, right? Absolutely. There's some really good stuff. I know that uh, Mark Darrow, the EP, and Mike Laidlaw, and Dave Gator is a big backer as well. So, yeah, um, yeah love it. Um, what would be your advice to any current game development students that dream of working at a Bioware studio one day? <laughs> Apply. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, it's, it's, it's what um, our crankiest, oldest writer, uh, Luke, <laughs> regularly tells people. Is. I, know he is. <laughs> uh, I went to college with Luke. Yeah. I've known him yeah. 25 years. He's yeah. really cranky. <laughs> uh, but if it, it really depends on what, like, I don't know if you're looking at design, if you're looking at programming, if you're looking at, um, you know, art, but... Uh, yeah. Art? Okay. So it's, uh, in any of those disciplines, it is all about developing a portfolio, uh, developing a body of work that shows both that you have the, uh, the, the level of skill and craftsmanship necessary to make something that would be in a shipped game. And also, the more challenging part sometimes is showing that you have the ability to hit deadlines. Um, yeah. uh, w when writers want to apply, one of the things I tell them is get a job doing writing. It doesn't matter if it's game writing. Get a job doing copy, copywriting, marketing writing. Get a job at a newspaper that shows that you can hit a 5 p.m. deadline because there's a difference between, hey, I worked on this for two weeks and I made this awesome story and it's, it, it, everyone who reads it cries and it's great, but you also have to be able to make something that's done by five. Um, so showing that you can do it at a professional level and hit deadlines is just as important. Yeah, and if I could jump in on that, the other thing I would really encourage you to do is to get critiques. Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of what we do is sit in meetings and have our ideas uh, not always beaten down, but you know, twisted and 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 changed. And okay, that part of what you did was good. That part of what you did was good. But we're working with teams of people, right? So it's not just you walking in with your fabulous idea, which was great. And then Patrick points out the huge flaw in my fabulous idea, and I go, oh, okay, great. And it's it is disappointing. And and learning how to deal with that flash of well crap, you know, I just spend a whole lot of time working on that, but being able to work with your colleagues and accept those other ideas and have someone give you feedback and fix it, you know, because we're, we're very collaborative, but there comes a point when push comes to shove and what Mike says goes, and so we need to all make that happen. So the ability to balance that creative passion that you have to do it with being able to work with other people is really important, and that'll make your job in the industry that much more satisfying when you get you allow yourself to have the satisfaction of what you what the joy of what you're doing come from that working with groups of other people not just yourself I, I think just again to jump on that I, the the artists and writers and designers who who make it uh, at Bioware in particular but really anywhere in the industry aren't the ones who never have any of their stuff blown up yeah. Uh, they're the ones who have their stuff blown up, and then they pick themselves off. They learn from the constructive yeah. criticism, and they, you know, they make their next pass better to the point where you know people who see the final product in the game see this as something that just might must have sprung full form from their head, like you know Athena from Zeus. Which never happens. No. Nope. No, and it never happens. Every everything that you see, every every beautiful moment, every awesome landscape was something that probably got blown up once, if not twice. Yeah. And and just finally. Follow your dreams, right? If it's something that you're really passionate about, just do it and keep trying because it's absolutely worthwhile. You don't get stuck in a bank job, right? Um, so just keep keep at it and um, it's absolutely worth it. Howdy. Hi. Hey. Um, oh, this is probably a sensitive issue for a lot of people here, but in regards to the ending of Mass Effect 3, I was sort of oh, I was waiting for this. <laughs> we figured it was coming. Everyone do a shot. Yeah. <laughs> I personally didn't have a problem with it, but as a, as a team, how did it feel when the reaction was so strong? And yeah, I was just wondering how that felt around the office and whatnot, so. Well, I, it always stings. I mean, you, you, you obviously, you know, it would have been nice had everyone gone, oh, that was fantastic. But I think really the worst possible reaction to Mass Effect 3's ending would have been a bunch of people going, eh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, so we, Knowing that you evoked passion from it, you have to look at that and know that that meant that you had people emotionally engaged. So yeah. you can see that side of it. I was directly on the front lines of fan response. I was right there on social media. I was right there on the BSN. I was visiting other forums. I was reading the comments. And now we know there were a few people that had never played the game that were jumping on the bad wagon of, hey, we're attacking something. Let's all go have fun. Ah! But then they disappeared because that's what happens. You know, you, you have fun at somebody's expense and then you go off and have fun at somebody else's expense. The people that stuck around and wanted serious change was because they cared. And like Patrick said, the, I called it the Oscar Wilde principle, which is it is better to be talked about than to not be talked about. That if we had released the game and everybody had gone, yeah, that's great. It, it would have been worse. You know, we want to, and there were, you know, everybody's like, everybody hated the endings. No, that, that's not true. There were a lot of people that either were okay with the endings, they didn't love them, they didn't hate them, it was like, yeah, it was okay, good. Or there were a number of people that really enjoyed them. But there were a lot of very vocal people who didn't like them. And I equate the story to, uh, if you go to a restaurant and you have a good meal, you probably don't really tell people about it. You know, if somebody asks you, yeah, I'm going to go over there and eat, have you been there? Oh, yeah, it's good. You should try the chicken. It's good. You don't really tell about it. But if you go to a restaurant and you have a really bad meal, you'll tell your friends. I went out last night, went into this place. It was awful. The service was terrible. It was horrible. Don't ever go there. So there was this great, big, loud fan reaction. And as Patrick said, it would have been, you know, we would have loved it if everybody had loved it what we did, we knew that wasn't going to happen. We were reaching the end of a trilogy of games where people had put in hundreds of hours of gameplay. Uh, some people had more in-game romance time with their characters than they did in real life. <laughs> you know, uh, we knew we were going to invoke a lot of strong emotion one way or the other. And 
yes, we wish it had been more positive, more people had enjoyed it, but again, it was because they cared. And to the credit of, you know, Patrick was on the team at the time, Casey Hudson and the whole Mass Effect team, they listened. It would have been really easy for them to have hidden, to have, you know, put their heads down and said, no, we're done, that's it, uh, DLC coming next month. Yeah. They didn't, they li and it's hard. It's really hard when you've put stuff in uh, as a dev team for years making this game to have people say how bad it is. But they didn't. They, they listened and they made the extended cut because it was the right thing to do and release it you know, for free to the fans because again, it was the right thing to do. And I probably shouldn't say this, there was discussion, should it be charged? And Casey Hudson said no. We can't do that. We have to make this better. We, we can do a better job finishing the game, providing clarity, answering some questions. And it was very important to the team to end it as best as possible. And I think with you know, the extended cut and then the DLCs ending with the Citadel, who here played the Citadel DLC? Good, awesome. good amount of people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, now we're at, a, we're, we're at a good enough spot. So yeah. it's really I, I think to Chris's point earlier, it's, it's something that you learn from as well. So going forward, you know, we've, we've learned those lessons and we can take some of that into the next games that we do. So Yeah, I mean, it allowed us to have some amazing conversations with some amazing people yeah. about what was so important and how you felt. And, and you know, they, the way they weren't all easy conversations by a long shot, but they were really good to have. And, and I think we learned a lot and it was it was really cool to get to be able to talk to people about that. I think looking back on it, with some time having passed, it's fascinating just to see the context of, unlike Dragon Age, giving you Commander Shepard for three games, and from the start of the third game, we knew that, and, and foreshadowed pretty strongly that this was the end of Shepard. We knew that we were we were going to have Shepard sacrifice him or herself, and trying to foreshadow that through the game, trying to uh, trying to honor that. And at the end, I think a lot of the fan reaction uh, this is uh, this doesn't mean it's unjustified at all is just grief. It's, uh, it's some of the most raw responses I've gotten have been people who are who are grieving. Um, because a character that was really important to them died and you know died for a worthy cause but died and that sucks and I think it's an important story to tell and I'm, I'm glad we told it and it's also been fascinating to see what we learned from that and it sucks for us too every time he <laughs> killed someone I'd be sitting there editing I cried so much edit Morden oh well, yeah yeah Morden right I literally, yes. I was in my room playing it, and I got to the spot, and I was playing it in character, and I made the hard choice. I'm not going to ruin it for anybody who hasn't got to it yet. The game's been out for years. <laughs> People still get upset when you talk about Vader. <laughs> yeah. And I literally, I did push back my desk, and I was like, no! <laughs> and my roommates were like, what the hell? I was like, I can't talk. <laughs> There was, so there was, I had to play test um, at one point, I just came out, because for people who got emotionally engaged in Mass Effect 3, imagine what it's like to make it and to have to go through and play test it. And you guys have the luxury of only playing um, Sucky Loser Shepherd if you want to play Sucky Loser Shepherd, We had to test it. So I'd be like, <laughs> dude, how was your day? Well, first I shot Morden. <laughs> Then I killed Ashley in the council confrontation. <laughs> then I went on the mission and saw Samara and let her kill herself. <laughs> <laughs> then later I headed off and, uh, and had, had Tally uh, go off a cliff <laughs> after Legion killed himself. And, <laughs> and then Rex came and I had to shoot Rex as well. And it's the most depressing play. <laughs> I'm still wondering why you guys it, like, like it's stuff. hilarious how depressing you're just like, wow, this is <laughs> these are some bad life choices. <laughs> <laughs> but valid if you chose them. Anyway. <laughs> Next question. 
Greetings. Hello. Um, this is another cre question to the uh, producer. You s mentioned that you've only been there for a year now, today. Yeah. Uh, could you give us some insight into your history before Bioware? Uh, before Bioware, I was with uh, Visceral Games, which is part of EA, for about four years. So that's the guys that make Dead Space and, and things like that. Um, and then before that, so that was in Melbourne, actually. Um, and before EA, I was with a number of local studios like Tantalus Transmission. I've done pony games. I've done games where you like soap up a little animal and like scrub him. Um, I've done flight combat games. You know, a whole range of different things um, for like the last sort of 13 years. But uh, it was really, you know, Bioware was always my dream job. So it didn't matter what I had to do. Uh, you know, I was going to do it at some point. So. Uh, but that, that's basically my career. You know, I went in as a, as a producer um, because I had a lot of experience in management. Um, and, but it, it was really like I could have this boring, boring job where I'd do the same thing day in, day out um, until a mate of mine said, Cam, what do you love? And he's, I'm like, games, man. He's like, well, just get a job in the industry, you idiot. I'm like, hmm, makes, <laughs> makes a bit of sense. So I'm like, okay. Um, and so, yeah, like three months later, I wrapped up my business and, and moved into the games industry and never looked back. I'd never do anything else. And uh, after all that, um, what's working like? What's working at Bioware and like having that huge responsibility towards the publishers and the lead designers? Uh, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, the culture at Bioware is like nothing I've seen um, in, in previous companies. So uh, it's so creative and it's so uh, everyone is just so bloody good at their job um, that really it's not about um, unlike some other companies where you kind of have to push things through at Bioware, it's more about unleash the awesomeness, <laughs> right? And great stuff happens. Um, so I, I just feel very privileged to, to have an opportunity to work with the guys. So um, yeah, I love it. Thank you. He's being too kind. I can't imagine that trying to get us to do anything isn't like <laughs> trying to herd a bunch of rabid cats around. <laughs> They're very cute cats. So at each other's like, throats. Yeah. No, no, you guys are great. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you again for Hi. coming. Um, I want to give props up for DA2 because I'm one of those freaks who loved it. So, you know, you're not a freak. Are, no, you're not a little, freak. There are, there are little crews of us around. We'll get lynched later, but we still loved it. Um, I actually come from modding, so that's where I started with Neverwinter Nights and then went all the way through DA, uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, and then through to Spiritual Successor DAO and all that sort of stuff. I mean, fan generated content in the terms of the full mods, not talking just the modded content, because you can do, I mean, you can't stop the modding. Yeah. happens um, and we'll do it anyway <laughs> but um, the full like I mean I remember early Neverwinter Nights and Neverwinter Nights 2 creating and then playing through user generated full mods that that because Dragon Age is about the world the user generated mods were part of that world and I didn't know whether you were looking I mean the more and more triple A's are going away from that sort of thing will you be bringing that back at all so um, we've, we've talked about it you know we've, we've looked into it I mean the, the frostbite engine it's, it's very hard um, to do that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I can't really talk to, to plans on that side of things, but, you know, you do see a lot of games doing it. I think it's a, a rising trend in the industry to do this, particularly in, um, in even some big games, you know, but mostly PC orientated games, right? So, um, I was playing Neverwinter Online for a while, um, and that's got the foundry there, you know, and that's a cool game, you know, like, I didn't have to stop playing it because I'm like, whatever, and I, I spend too much money on it. Um, but but it, the foundry is great, right? It's a really simple way to, to craft these experiences. Um, you know, I think games going forward uh, will improve on that, and they can learn from that. Um, maybe we'll do something. I don't know. Um, it, it's a lot of effort to put a, a tool set together in a way that all fans can use it, not just your hardcore like game students or game developers. Yep, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, traditionally, um, there's been a bit of a thing with Eastern and Western development um, where a lot of Eastern developed games are a bit morally ambiguous and Western are a bit more cut and dry with good is good and bad is bad. You've already shown in the trailer where a specific decision of yours can result in death of a village, or at least it looks like that. Um, with the new game, do you envisage yourself going more towards the morally ambiguous side of things where good ad actions can lead to bad endings or is it going to be a bit more traditional epic where the good always do good and the bad always do bad with your choices? Well, how to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think looking at our games, there are times when there are, cl then there, when there are choices that you can say are very morally clear. Um, there are also times when there are choices that are fairly murky, um, whether you say it's by Western standards or just by game standards in general. So I think it's some, I would be surprised if we ever moved away from what you think of as, uh, as the Bioware choices. There are always going to be points where we're going to make you pick A or B. Um, and you will know that consequences are coming and, may, you know, and neither choice is going to be perfect. Uh, but one of the things that I think we can add to that is the ability to have an impact on the environment. Uh, because that is a choice that can be morally neutral. Uh, it can be something where I can't get into, I, every time I watch, there is an example, and then Cameron just reaches and punches yeah. me. Uh, but things that you can do that impact the environment that you can say, oh, I, I did this for good reasons, or I did this because I'm in charge, and I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay down the law. And I, you know, both interpretations are right. Uh, so I think, I think it's something where ideally we're going to offer some opportunities for people who want to see something that's a little bit more morally ambiguous but without changing our core story and core values that way. Okay, thanks. Yes, hi. Um, with the, obviously, the Star Wars, the Old Republic, and the precursors for that, do you feel that you've ended that storyline? Like, obviously, with, uh, this is going to be spoilers, with, I think it was Revan appearing in the Old Republic? Are yeah. you asking whether there's going to be a KOTOR 3? Yeah, <laughs> is that where you're going with this? <laughs> I'm just asking if you feel that you're finished with that type of storyline. Um, well, it's important to remember that uh, up at BioWare Edmonton, where we're from, we didn't work on Star Wars The Old Republic. Uh, we know people bit. that did. <laughs> the MMO. You know, yeah, we yeah. didn't work on the MMO up in Edmonton. Uh, we did work, I was part of the QA team at the time on Knights of the Old Republic. And... Uh, we had a great time working on it, and it did pave the way to it. We didn't work on Knights of the Old Republic 2, uh, really just because LucasArts wanted it faster than we were prepared to be able to develop it in. But uh, I think the story is still there. I mean, whether or not Bioware ever returns to you know Knights of the Old Republic or whatever, certainly not in the short term. We're very focused on Dragon Age Inquisition, on the next Mass Effect title. But theoretically, Possible. We had such a good time working with LucasArts, but nothing, nothing going on right now. Um, with Dragon Age Inquisition, uh, with the uh, the party, um, do you know if you're moving towards a larger party in the style of Dragon Age Origins or Mass Effect Two, or a smaller party like Mass Effect Three or Dragon Age Just Two? A question: Do you, do you mean party as in? the group that's with you at any given time, or do you uh, mean the a party as selection in the, the selectable pool. group of characters? Oh, okay. Um, well, then we can't answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you have answered either you one? So well much for clarifying. No, yeah. no. <laughs> um, and following on from that, are uh, you going to be doing the Mass Effect style thing where some of your choices can get your followers killed? Mm. Another thing we might be able to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid. a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I need to give Bioware pins to everyone that I say I can't say anything to. Yeah. yeah. That's an apology. Hi. Um, basically, I'll just clarify first. Um, love your writing. Um, been a big fan since my now husband introduced me to Knights of the Old Republic way, way back. We're going back seven years now. Um, and then you brought out Mass Effect, um, which really resonated since I've been a long time fantasy and sci-fi freak. Um, these days, there's a lot of expanded content in regards to books and comics. Now, with the Mass Effect trilogy, obviously, you've brought out a number of those. Now, before Mass Effect 3, you actually brought out some prequel novels, and some of those characters actually showed up during Mass Effect 3. Now, how much of that was actually pre-planned from the get-go? Some. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, well, if, or if I can say, because part it. of what the editors do is, is try and keep track of the, with every game and with every book, rather vast um, amount of IP that we generate. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a book is written, there's a character, and the plan for that character is to be then used in a game. But it's sort of kept as a pool and, you know, a, a potential a group of characters from which we can draw. So it will be more like, oh, there's a plot line and, and it 
you know, would, would be cool if, if we could tie it back to something that's happened before, and so we'll go back and, and draw from it, but it, it's kind of a mix. Occasionally, there'll be one that goes forward, but I'm looking at you, how, who just wrote it. If book. I could plug my book. I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we, I, we do it both ways. Uh, there are some times where uh, we I put... that. I know. Okay. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. True. Really? Oh my God. Anyway, book. So, Go as, as Karen, to whom I was definitely listening, said, uh, yes, we do, get, we do it as the push and we do it as the pull. Um, but yes, so for example, uh, as you, anyone who's read the summary for the upcoming Dragon Age Masked Empire knows um, that that book is going to be about um, Empress Selene and Grand Duke Gaspard. And anyone who read Asunder knows that uh, some stuff goes on betwixt the two. There's some unhappiness. People die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we foreshadowed that in Asunder. And that's something that we looked at and said, well, OK, I think it, as something that we might possibly have an interest in looking at in Dragon Age Inquisition, this would be something that it would be great to get a more detailed version of, to, to look at it more, uh, in more depth and kind of give it, the, give it the narrative time it really deserves. So I, I don't know, does that answer the question? <laughs> it plugs my book, which is the important thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Next. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming down. Hi. Um, I have a really random question. <laughs> uh, are you guys ever looking to continue the Jade Empire universe? <laughs> so, kind, kind of like Knights of the Old Republic, uh, currently no, potentially maybe. Uh, I will say this though, Mark Darrow, uh, who's the EP on, on Dragon Age, who's also the EP on, on uh, Jade Empire, one of the first things I did when I got over there and started my job, I'm like, dude, Jade Empire 2, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> but yeah, for the moment it's all, all about uh, you know, the, the Dragon yeah. Age Acquisition and, and the next We one. really did love working on Jade Empire, it is, I'm one of the few people, it's my favorite game from Bioware because it opened the door to allow us to make our own games. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, we were known for working on Dungeons and & Dragons and working on LucasArts games. By doing Jade Empire, even flawed as it was, it let us make Mass Effect and it let us make Dragon Age. So hopefully someday we return. And I'd say just for my own self-interest, keep asking. Yeah, yeah, keep asking. Really. Uh, That's a really good. Part we of say, it. Yeah. People say it was. I mean, imagine. I don't know who your plays uh, played at any point. Mass Effect multiplayer. Anybody? Wow. Awesome. Okay. Wow. Cool. Okay. Just looking at when we went from the game that shipped to expansion for the the DLC, uh, the additional packs. What we get? What we do? Four, five, something like that. By the end of it, you could have a character who completely ignored cover and was entirely a melee-focused character, as <laughs> as Karen, <laughs> the Krogan warlord, will attest. We've gotten so much better at doing that type of combat. Uh, you know, something that is action action-oriented, melee-focused. I would love to see what a modern Bioware brings to that. I think that would be fantastic. As Chris said, it's not something that we're really you know, focusing on at this time, but please keep asking. Because mm -hmm. well, we kept developing that because people enjoyed it and asked for more. So it's, if you guys want it, keep telling us <laughs> that's what you want. Um, this is a question for the writers, really, I guess. Um, is writing the choices that the characters have to make one of the most uh, challenging slash exciting things that you do and is it always going to be a cornerstone of your games because that's what separates them from for example books and movies that you actually get to make the choice whereas you don't in the other media uh, yes I think I this is the part where the Bioware writer shoots himself in the foot because I'm not sure that choice is if you had to ask me what the one thing that that Bioware writers really either enjoyed or, or did best. I think our, we, we do choices and we enjoy doing choices, but for me it's always been about the characters. Mm -hmm. If you said we, have to, we, had to have a, we had to lose either choices in our games or, or you don't get to have followers, I would lose the choices first uh, because the followers for me are what 
keep me coming back to play and replay. Now, that's it. To, to answer the question you, uh, you did originally ask, it's an interesting mindset to get into. It's very easy to just say, save the baby or save the warlock, and people are going to really agonize over that. No, they're not. That's not a choice. That's, that's an opportunity for branching, and then the person who wants to feel evil can do that one, and that's about 12% of our player base. The really interesting choices, the difficult ones, are the ones that get people to debate and argue on internet forums, or the ones that get people to have discussions where actually both people are right, and the discussion reveals that they see the world in fundamentally different ways. Um, I really enjoyed doing the Geth Quarian uh, war, and I loved, I loved the final choice, and my hope what I said from the get-go was I wanted the Quarians to be wrong when you look at it from a completely objective, logical viewpoint. And I want to see if I can make the objectively wrong people sympathetic enough that people will actually side with them. And, and several people did. And I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of that because it, it started a discussion. It made people argue. And, you know, and I, objectively wrong may not actively be objectively right for me saying it. It's, when you create situations that gray, that's fascinating, and I love that. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, people are talking a lot about tie-ins, if there's any plans for a pen and paper Mass Effect RPG. Wow. Ooh. I'd buy it. Yeah. Buy it. yeah I, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have any members of our business development team yeah, here who, who may or may not be able to answer that question. Um, new stuff comes along all just the time, though. Now. So, yeah, I'll just, I'll just chat <laughs> with them and say, and Chris, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually at time, but I uh, just spoke oh. to Chris and he's going to give us a few more minutes. Uh, so, we'll try and get, uh, we probably won't be able to get to everyone. Uh, we've just got a question here. Thanks. All right, um, so basically with the Mass Effect 3 trilogy, with the Renegade and Paragon and the, the blue and the red questions, for Dragon Age Inquisition, do you reckon you will have that obvious good or bad questions or would it be like with the options of talking? Would it be um. red or blue or white? <laughs> 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 well, I think... You write them. Well, yeah. So what I would say is, I think the, the good news and bad news was that when you looked at the persuades, is what we call them, the, the, yes, the highlighted red or blue text, the joke became that, oh, you complex moral situation. Wait, does it have blue or red text? OK, well, then that's how you win. And so what I, I think what we want to do, at least on, on, in, on Inquisition, we want to be aware of that. That doesn't mean we never use anything like that, because I think the idea of having um, some kind of prerequisite based dialogue option that allows you to get a more optimal outcome is cool. And whether that is something that you get by putting points into a stat or by having someone in your party or by making choices earlier in the game that unlock that dialogue option, I think that rewards the player playing the game. And I like that. Um, what we don't want to do is have every difficult moral decision rendered moot by the presence of brightly glowing text. Um, just a quick one to go back to the choices again. Um, a lot of the choices in games nowadays, they seem to be pretty much a case of you pick it and once you've played it, you know what that choice is always going to turn out like. Uh, has any thought been given to creating a situation where you go in and you've got the choice to save the warlock or save the baby, but something random goes on in the background and you've saved the baby, but then the dragon wipes out the city, or you save the warlock, but then the baby grows up real quick and kills him or something? <laughs> <laughs> just to create a little bit of difference, so you can't just go online, grab the guide and go, okay, I want this outcome, so I can just pick these choices. So, so a random element in the outcomes? Yeah, just, um, a, well, a lot more random, I guess, yeah. Well, it's something we looked at. I think we've decided against it, generally speaking, because it ended up, when we tried implementing something like that, it ended up not feeling satisfying. Um, play our players, at least in general, um, 
seem to like the if x then y. They like cause and effect, the choice and consequence. Uh, so as much as having the random element seems interesting, I think random elements would be something that we might add to the setup to make things more complicated. That might flavor your choice. But I think playing around with the consequences, uh, it ended, every time we've tried it, it ends up feeling cheap. Yeah, I think random, random elements in games are very tricky because you can get to the point where the player feels that they're not in control. Um, so they can make a decision and then some random event occurs and they can feel punished for it um, through no, no fault of their own. So you need to be really careful with it. I think rippling decisions that go through on multiple layers that are still decided upon, they're not random, you know, that would be really interesting to explore. But um, pure randomness would be very weird. I'd get mad if like, I made yeah. a decision and, and then something random or, happened. It's like, or oh even worse, I wouldn't get mad, I'd reload. And, yeah, that's true. And anything yeah. where you get them, where you get the optimal thing by reloading and then doing just what you did before in hopes that the random number generator will work for oh, you. Yeah. That's we're just <laughs> the the optimal way to play the game is to not have fun at that point. Hi. Um, Hi. In Mass Effect Three, with the multiplayer, whose idea was it to make multiplayer completion so important to the galactic, galactic readiness, and why? I have no idea who's. Well, I can take yeah. a crack at yeah, it. I know, <laughs> sort of, yeah. yeah. We're not the gameplay team. So. <laughs> but I think we wanted, yeah, I, I believe it was Preston, it was the lead, Preston, designer, yeah, our lead designer. Because we didn't want it to be something that was uh, tied to any individual plot element. We wanted it to be something that you could play during the course of the game or after the game. And we wanted there to be a reward for playing it. Um, having it be tied to the readiness score was I think what we came to is the best possible way to show a positive reaction, but not make it uh, punitive if you never played it. <laughs> G'day, guys. Um, just a question. You mentioned that you're all obviously gamers and that the writers of Bioware were big fans of the characters they write. And you look at something that's come out recently, like, say, The Last of Us, which is very character focused. It just sort of made me wonder, what are the games in the last few years that Bioware hasn't made that <laughs> has made you guys go, oh crap, we need to do more, or they've set a bar in, like around the office, say, and, and, and really Ooh. gone to you guys? Good question. Yeah, yeah. it is good. <laughs> and actually, I, it, I think of it as being, you know, that because we're all out there lining up and pre-ordering and everything too, and so I think of it as being that we don't really have water coolers, but you know, what we're talking about in the kitchen. Um, I, For well, me, I it was walking, The Walking oh, Dead. I was just yeah. gonna say, Walking Dead is one that yeah. we talked about a well, lot. As we we all just yeah. went nuts for The Walking Dead. Yeah. I liked, uh, I really was impressed with how Bioshock uh, Infinite, it's been, the, it's been the case with all the Bioshock games, um, how well their level design and their level art mm -hmm. tied into the narrative. Mm -hmm. That's something I've always loved. We, you know, it feels like in some of the Bioware games, we hit that at our best moments, but I think we can do better. And I, you know, I'd love to see that. Hey guys, um, just got a question about your uh, how you find it with writing with the books and then trying to mix it with, with the, uh, all the ideas that you have of writing the main character. So in the books, you get to write pretty much what you want, an amazing character doing what he wants, being a badass. Then you write in the games and you have to write him being a bit of a doofus and a bit of an <laughs> idiot and he's not always going to be what you want. How do you square that away with uh, writing the bad versions, the crappy versions of Shepard? How do you deal with that? Well, it's tough, yeah. Um, and we, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I mean, we just, we have to be, be vigilant. And it's interesting because at least observing how the writers are, are coming up with plot lines, they'll usually come up with one or the other, you know? And, and so the, the first way is the Paragon Ray or they'll come up with a, the Renegade Way. And then it's a matter of our, our writing, the writing pits, we call them, are just amazing places to overhear the conversations because you know, someone will come up with one of these ideas and then, you know, be working away and say, okay, I can't figure this out. What, what is going to be fun? And, and it's interesting that people do sort of split, like Mr. Paragon here is always going to have the Paragon lines, but then they're renegade, you know, people who are solidly renegade. And so the listening to you guys talk about yeah. what's going to be satisfying for both types of players is fascinating. I I think it, it does go to an argument against a, a single writer game, at least from Bioware, yeah. because if you have one where here's the one where Shepard is awesome and here's the one where Shepard is a doofus, then, then you've done something wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there should be something where 
the Paragon player feels like that was the right way, and the Renegade player feels like that was the right way as well. I, I think, you know, I, I'm not saying we always hit it 100 percent, but you look at you look at some of our best plots. Well, making Chris shoot Morton. Um, <laughs> You know that was that was a renegade option, and wow, we did that. We agonized over yeah. that stinking moment. That was that was a pain. And the interesting thing was we worked so hard on getting that one right that when player you because you know that was the one. Well, I don't want to do that, but I that's the one I got to focus on. All right, it's got to be perfect. I got every line has to be right. The, the player can never not realize they're going to shoot Morden. Like, no one wants, surprise, I shot my favorite follower. Yeah. Like, it has, like, that one had to be crystal clear. That's why it's an interrupt. Like, I've raised the gun, I've said I will shoot you, and then the renegade I, I interrupt flashes. I wonder what will happen. Yeah. Uh, but the interesting thing was on our first play, uh, the first time it got peer reviewed by the writers, the, the other writer, who is a giant um, light side hippie, uh, played through it. Well, she is. Uh, said, <laughs> well, that was really great, you guys, but. The light side, I don't know, it was okay. It didn't really make me sad or anything like that. It was just like, oh, okay, bye, Morden, see you later. So we, so we we realized we'd focus so much on the renegade side because that was when we were worried about. We hadn't put in the due diligence to, you know, to, to, to knock the Paragon side out of the park. And so we had to go back and put in the moments and add the add the little touches here and there that actually made it, you know, as as much of a reward for the Paragon players that most of us are as the Renegade one was for the Renegade players. I'm always bad. <laughs> always. Every Bioware game I've always been bad. Well, and it's a great thing about working with such a huge group of people is because, you know, and, and we play those over and over and there are yeah. many, many levels of review that the plots go through. And so... Um, and well, it makes it so much stronger. It takes a, yeah, and it, it takes, it's usually a process of kind of winnowing yeah. it down, you know, chipping it away and, and getting it to move in the direction that you want and having people call you on, okay, that's not going to be satisfying yeah. for a player who's following that path. That's shippable, um, but it's not it's not awesome. And if yeah. this is supposed yeah. to be the big awesome, well, okay, um, you you've played Mass Three, right? Did you did you? Yeah, okay. more than <laughs> seashells. It's okay. <laughs> Whatever. No, we all get busy. It's hard to finish yeah. all the games. <laughs> um, more than that, the seashell line would have would have liked to run tests on the seashells. Yes. Uh, that wasn't he does in the talk original. like that when he writes. Them, I, by the way. Yeah. After after very long days, yeah, that line wasn't in the original. In the original Paragon side, we were just like Ben and Honor Shepherd, and and we realized it needed to be more, and that's how the seashell line got in there, and spawned some really really awesome fan art. <laughs> Thanks. Hi guys, how are you? Oh, sorry. Um, in just back to Dragon Age for a second. Um, in the Witch Hunt. There's an option at the very end of the Grey Warden to go off with uh, Morrigan. And I was wondering if that was the last we see of the Grey Warden in Dragon Age. Good question. That is a really good Cameron. question. Cameron. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> can Everybody you do a shot. Can you blink <laughs> once for yes? <laughs> Shrug your shoulders for no. Dance? You know what? I can say it. I haven't said it. We're not allowed to tell there you. Ah. Guys. <laughs> Thanks anyway, guys. It Appreciate it. Love that you uh, came down. I love the series. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on it. Oh, yeah. It's just good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just. I'm going to actually ask a question, if that's okay. So I'm a Mass Effect fan. I've had many hours of Shepard just staring at me blankly while I've decided what I'm going to choose. Mm. And at the end, I fought hard, and she killed the Reapers, and she took a breath, and then that was it. it does she live? She lives in my heart and my mind, but does she and live? That, and that's the only thing well, that matters. But that's the important part, yeah. right? Yeah. She, she no, is. seriously, who are we to tell you different? Would you, be, would you be happy with us if I said, no, she's dead? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's up to you. It, and seriously, it, I've had it's, people ask me, yeah. you know, is indoctrination real or not? Mm. Does Shepard live or die at the end? And it's up to you, the fan, <laughs> because it is the nature of your playthrough of how you crafted Shepard in your story. I have playthroughs, and I said this to some people in line, out of like five playthroughs, one of my male and one of my female Shepherds were absolutely indoctrinated, but not the other three. And I had some where Shepard was dead at the end of the game, and I had some where he or she was alive. And it is up to you where it should be, and it should never come from Bioware, in my opinion, that we say, 
he or she lived, he or she died, indoctrination was real, indoctrination was false, whatever it should be. It should be up to you and how you want to continue your story. Great, awesome. Well, I think that you've given <laughs> us an extra 10 minutes. So thank you thank very you. much for that. Thank Everybody, be a round of applause. So just, just, just thank you again. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for, for waiting in line for all that time. We really appreciate it. We, we can't do support. what we do without you guys. Yeah, so, we yeah, really can't. Really so thank you for thank all you. your feedback. And we are still here uh, Saturday and Sunday as well. We, we don't have any more panel time, but we are going to be wandering around the convention. Uh, you can follow at Patrick Weeks on Twitter, at Bell and Canto. 114. 114. 114. It's a and really at Cameron Lee will be tweeting out when we can hook up to the internet mm -hmm. around here where we are. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for having us here. We hope to be back again next year. Uh, thanks all very much for coming thank out. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you.